So if you watched my last video, you'll know that this big 36 inch Dewall bandsaw is very new to me. I know that it runs and in theory you could stick a blade on this thing and start cutting with it, but it has all sorts of little issues that need worked out. And I don't like messing with equipment that doesn't work the way that it should. So let's test the hydraulic table out on this thing. We got to fill the tank up, test the pump. Please let this thing work. Work out all the guide issues on and on and on, right? There's a million things that need to be done to this saw before it will work like it should. We got to make a new blade. You'll see, ton of stuff. So let's get started because I'm stoked to be able to use this thing. So the first thing that I want to do to this saw is drain the, what, what's in this gearbox out because the chances of it being any good or probably zero and uh, I'm going to put in just a lightweight motor oil just to flush this thing out until I get the proper stuff to put in here but I will trust a lightweight motor oil far more than what I trust what's in here now so we'll flush it and then later we'll change it with some good stuff hopefully and I'm getting metal chunks out of here The sight of oil is promising, but it is full of goo. Probably a pint or two is not a great thing. Lots of fine metal debris, but you know, who knows? The gearbox this old is going to have some metal in it. So this is why you trust nothing and check everything. Not much oil in there. See all the fine metal particles? Hopefully you can see those. I mean, that's not surprising you know, with a gearbox of that, old, that age, and it doesn't really concern me. Long as it hasn't been ran dry, right? That's the main thing, and hopefully there's no real damage in there. But this is why we flush them out. So there's maybe a little better look at what come out of the oil on the first grain. Lots of little sparkly bits in there. Uh, nothing surprising. Uh, almost every old gearbox that doesn't get changed regular will look like this. You know, those little sparkly bits come from the gears rubbing together uh, over time, raising up burrs and then little burrs of metal breaking off and falling down to the bottom of the gear case. And, you know, usually that's where they stay. And that's why we're flushing, uh, flushing this out. So I got the drain plug back in it, and the first flush is just going to be diesel fuel, just a light oil, right? This stuff will break loose any of the sediment and stuff that's in there, and then we'll drain this out, and hopefully it'll get the majority of the goo out of there. Okay, so it looks like this thing holds around a quart. So we'll just run this slow, uh, you know, under no load, and just kind of flush it out, right? So last week a viewer mentioned that it looks like that main drive pulley coming out of the transmission is running out like crazy, but that's just the pain on the pulley. It's It actually runs very true. When I first seen it, I thought the exact same thing, and I checked it, and uh, there's nothing wrong with it. It just kind of looks wonky. Let's see uh, what comes out on the first first flush. Okay. 
So after the second flush with the diesel fuel, that's what come out of it. Not a whole lot. So it's getting cleaner and uh, you know, it'll continue to get cleaner. I'll do this a couple more times and uh, it'll be good enough. So I flushed this gearbox a total of three times, twice with diesel fuel just to get the big chunks out and then the final time, or not, yeah, the final flush, I guess you'd say, with a, a 10 to be 30 motor oil. Just standard cheap detergent motor oil in hopes that it'll remove some of the tarnish and suspend some of the, uh, some of the other junk that's in there. And then, you know, we'll drain this out and soon when my actual gearbox fluid that this thing recommends comes in, we'll fill it with that. So here's an opinion for you, so take it for what it's worth. Back before we started racing to the bottom to see who could make the cheapest garbage possible at the at a minimal cost and a maximum profit, we used to make stuff like this. Back in the 50s, air tra travel was relatively new and it was you know kind of the hype at the time and everybody wanted stuff that was somewhat aeroplane designed or had similarities to the things that the highest technology that they were seeing in the skies like stuff on cars that were the dashboards resembled the cockpits of airplanes and so on and so on back in the 60s and 70s it was you know some like rocket type designs everything was neat and had shape and was you know I don't know, somewhat inspiring to me, just uh, just the look of them. Now everything is absolutely as square as possible. It's no character at all, cheap, flimsy stickers that are even put on crooked of this new stuff. It's like, wow, could you not take five seconds to put that sticker on straight, even though it's just a cheap sticker, at least have some pride enough to put it on correctly. So, we won't see an error like this again unless people decide they want it. But, you know, this is back when they made cool stuff, right? So here's a couple quick examples. This casting that is the gear selector, this wouldn't be here at all. It would be a cutout in the body with stickers that show you what gear is what. This gauge here would never have a chrome, a quality chrome bezel around it. <laughs> it wouldn't have dished glass on it that's uh, spherical, really nice. This cover for the grinding wheel would be an absolute box. The cover for the light would also be an absolute box. And there's just example after example on this saw of extra work that wasn't needed, but they did it because it was cool. I mean, cool costs money, but... Man, some of this stuff you think they could incorporate into these new designs. You know, yeah, it may raise the price a bit, but you're going to get a nicer product. You know, this is awesome to me. So here's another example of just plain cool from a very similar era, a little bit older. Look at the speed selector on this thing. Now, they could have easily done something cheaper than this and far more simple, but yet... You know, they wanted to stand out, right? They were making names for themselves. They were trying to you know, put forward the image that their products were quality. Check that out. A big brass ring with the beads on it that rotates when you turn this handle. Just absolutely awesome. You will never see something like that today. I don't even know that most people or most companies are capable of replicating the cool stuff that they did back then. So I know that some people will make the argument that if you make equipment more labor intensive to make, people will just buy the cheaper stuff. And some of that I'm sure is true, but there were cheaper saws available when these were sold and companies bought them by the semi loads. I think a lot of these factory owners and stuff were proud and you know they liked to see their employees working on quality equipment instead of these you know little pop cans that just somewhat resemble what they're supposed to be. It's like buying a pair of scissors from the dollar store. You buy something that looks like a pair of scissors, but after you use them two or three times, the blades are dull and the handle's broke. So there is room for awesomeness, and I think that somebody should step up and uh, take advantage of that because I do believe that it would sell instead of these shoe boxes that we're forced to buy these days. 
old belt for the hydraulic pump that is broken all to pieces. And a new one. Nice and soft. So here's kind of the nerve wracking part, and I'm hoping that this hydraulic system on this saw works. We've got four gallons of the mobile uh, DTE 24 Ultra. They are very proud of this stuff, but that's what this calls for. So we're going to be pouring it into the tank. Hopefully the hydraulic pump works. I added an extended drain valve here because it just had a plug in the tank before, and it would be impossible <laughs> to drain this thing the way it was set up without it just schmooing out all over the all over the foot of this machine. So this will hopefully allow me to stick a hose on the end of that barb fitting, put it over into a container, maybe push a little air pressure inside the tank and blow it out. That's kind of the idea. So let's fill it up, we'll put our belt on and then we will try it out. So there we go, four gallons later. So let's service these worn blade guides. I've got new bearings for top and bottom and we will quickly surface grind uh, the t ends of these guides. Get them back square and flush smooth again. Has that come out of there? Oh yeah, set screw. Just barely on there. So blade guides are one of the most important and one of the more overlooked parts of a bandsaw. I mean, it is what determines whether your, well, they had in a couple other factors, whether your cut is straight or not, right? So I want these to be in good shape. So here I'm just cutting off what's left of the lower uh, blade guide bearing. Um, 
it had come apart who knows how many years ago and uh, all that's left basically on this shaft is uh, is the inner inner part of the bearing race it, this is just a good way to get them off just split them almost all the way through and then hammer and a chisel to to break them they're usually so hard they break pretty easy so the reason I'm cutting this bearing uh, race off of the shaft is because I intended on on reusing these and not having to go through the trouble of making new ones but they just were so rough that I just decided not to do that and went over to the lathe and quickly uh, spun out a couple just better to make them new not have to mess with these ones that are all scored up So in order to avoid drilling holes in my workbench, I've clamped my arbor press to the table with this one large diamide clamp, which is really more than is necessary for the job that I'm going to be doing. Now, diamide sent me these clamps probably a year or so ago, and I've been using these over at the welding bench almost exclusively, and they quickly became my favorite clamps. I'll grab these things anytime that I need a clamp and if these will do the job that I want these are the ones that I grab versus the old style just standard C-clamp. Nothing wrong with those but you know these are nicer. I like the swiveling jaws. Just a good design. So check them out. They're a great company. American made and they did not ask me to show you these. Right? This is on me. And uh, I appreciate the support, and I appreciate these guys supporting the Barzi Summer Bash and the machinist community in, community in general. They don't have to do that. So go check them out. You know, they, Like I say, they're my favorites, and they're not very expensive given what you get. No, a little more. It's a little harder. There you go. You got it. Looks good. Thank you, love. He's a good, good dog. He, he just about understands English. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he does understand a lot of words. When you start talking, you got to watch what you say. Yeah, especially if you're leaving or going or... Yeah. You can do one little thing to him, getting ready to go somewhere, and he, he's on to it. Yeah, oh yeah, they, they notice those changes in patterns. They watch people close. You're shedding, buddy. You're shedding.
So because I want to do these all at one time, I have took a carriage bolt and ground two sides off of it. That way it slides through. You can put a nut and a washer on it and line them up and then we can clamp these in the vise and not worry about it uh, not clamping on all of them. All right, we'll just tighten this down. That should work pretty well. So I've got my blade guides clamped in the vise here. In the book it says that they should be very close, to, close as you can get them to 45 degrees because of the angle that the actual holder that these bolt in hold these. If you don't get them at 45, you're not going to touch on the blade flat, right? You're going to touch on either the tip or the back end. The blade guide's going to wear quickly, and then you'll be cutting a zigzag. So we don't want that. So in order to set this sign plate up, I like to use the uh, machinist calculator. Really quick, great tool. Got a ton of other functions that are uh, really useful in the shop as well. But if you just want to figure out sign and you don't know the formula to do that on paper, the Suburban Tool app works really good how to use a sign plate. Um, I like that, I got it on my phone for, for quick reference. But here's our stack, which is two, two inch, 0.7, and 0.128. So 2.828 inches below this back roll on this four inch sign. And that gives us 45 degrees. As close as we need to be to 45 degrees, which is Good enough. So I'll tighten this down, stick this on the grinder, make sure that my vise is square, and then dress up these, uh, these guides. So I've got quite a bit to grind off of these. They're hardened, so I don't want to overheat them, so we're going to be using coolant. Just trying to touch off here the highest one. Overheat them and make them soft, they'll just wear extremely quick. There we go. That's one side. So those look awesome. Really nice, nice match set of half inch guides. And in the book it says, after you get done grinding them, to make sure to uh, roll over these sharp edges. You know, they're not, they're not needed, right? So that's what we're doing. Just stoning the edges. This set of blade guides has been used and abused for a very long time. We had to take quite a bit off of them. I don't know how many more times they'll be able to be ground. But, yeah, a few. We get a lot of adjustment there. But you get the idea. These, um, you know, you can only take so much off of them before you lose uh, the ability to bolt them in the, in the holder. There's some big ones up there.
peach cobbler out of it. Yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah. Ground squirrels and groundhogs. I think that's it. At least for now. So setting up these blade guides has become quite the pain in the you-know-what. Um, I've been back and forth with this thing, working on it for about an hour, and I'm trying to get the upper guide in line with the lower guide. I want this bearing on the upper guide. This is a parallel, just held between these two metal guides with a little friction, and I'm pressing it up against, flat up against the face of this bearing. Well, before, when I just bolted this together as it was, these were not, this bearing face was not in line with the bearing face at the bottom. In fact, it was probably about 60 thousandths or better uh, off. This upper guide was back in relationship to the bottom one. So I added some shims behind this whole unit to space it out, moving this whole ram up and down, checking, making sure that this parallel just brushes the top of the bearing on the lower guide and that everything is 90 degrees to the table. I didn't want to show all that because it's quite slow, laborious, boring. But you get the idea. I've been struggling with this and I think that I got it. So let's make a blade for this thing and then see if this table works. That's really what I want to do. So here's the blade that we're going to use. It's an older roll of Starrett Flexback. This is half inch wide, 25 thousandths of an inch thick, 18 teeth per inch raker. And we need a band that is 174 inches long. So I'm just going to pull this out, set this up against that anvil. And at work, we just uh, push this up, push the end of the band up against the wall, and we have a mark on the floor. That way, we don't have to pull out a tape measure every time to get our blade length because we, we go through them quite often. So, before we weld this blade, we need to grind the ends of it so that when they made up, you know, we get a nice straight band. So, we're going to take one side of the blade and flip it over opposite of the other, and that way and hold them up against each other as, with the sides as parallel as we can get them. And we'll grind the ends. Now, since we've done that, since we made them opposite of each other, when we flip them back, because you know, they're both ground at the same time, they'll be nice and straight. Wow, that's noisy. You get the idea. Hopefully that made sense.
looks okay. Just the tension on a minute. Well, better leave this open and make sure it tracks. All right, so you may want to step back just a little because if this blade pops. It will stretch some, so I'll have to keep an eye on the tension. Okay, now I'll run these guides in, and I think I'll be ready to test this table. No leaks, that's good. I guess it's the moment of truth. doing something. Oh, it's reverse. Speed. It is. It is working. Speed. Put a layer in it. It is working. Reverse. Okay, so it just bypasses itself. Speed. Increase the speed. That is absolutely awesome. Forward. Reverse. I love this already. Uh, what else? Oh, we can test. I don't know if we can test that or not. Not without a cut. Pressure. How hard it pushes this table into the work. Forward or reverse. Now forward. Reverse, speed, speed, oh man, I'm so, so glad it's working. 
forward. These are just advance, right? Advance in one direction or the other. There's no speed control there. Well, maybe you can feather it. Let's see. So let's try to cut this piece of half inch plate. I think that's a really good first go. I know it'll cut by hand, right? I just want to make sure it cuts hydraulically. All right, so we're clamped down and I think ready to give this a shot. Speed the blade up just a bit. Okay, feed in. That is at uh, about one. Reduced it down to about half. I don't want to push too hard. Wow, that's doing awesome. Speed this up just a little to band. Like the guide bearings and everything are doing what they should be doing, both top and bottom. And I'm impressed. First cut. Well, I'm gonna learn how to ease this thing instead of just wide open. I like that. It's exciting. Okay. ones and two little babies. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're any of ours. Here, get your butt off the road, squirrel. <laughs> So that's as far as we're going to get this week. Did make a few cuts with this thing and I'm amazed at how straight this machine cuts. Uh, you know, when everything's in line, they should, especially a machine that this, that's this rigid. So got a lot done on this machine, not as much as I would like to, but I'm working on uh, customer jobs and everything in the background as well, which, um, you know, some of it I show, some of it I don't, but still a lot to do on this machine before 
it's done, but this is a usable machine now, and I'm, it's a great asset to the shop, that's for sure. I'm stoked to add this thing. And not to mention, the hydraulics on this thing worked, which I was 50-50 on whether the table would even work at all or not, because when I got this thing, if you watched my reveal video on it, the pump was basically running dry. It had almost no fluid in it at all, and who knows how long it had been run like that. And for me, I was like, well, that pump's probably shot. But luckily, it works. So that's a good thing. So I guess that's it. I want to get a coolant system on this thing as quick as possible because coolant and sawing go hand in hand. Your blades will last 50% longer uh, or more even in my experience if you use a good flood coolant on a saw blade and don't get into anything super hard it makes a huge difference so I want to get that straightened out on this along with several other little things right so a lot to do but at least it's usable now and I'm excited to have this thing so I think that's it got another YouTube machinist coming to the shop this weekend which I'll share with you so that'll be That'll be pretty neat to look forward to that. Uh, someone that you guys probably know, but maybe, maybe not. We'll see. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Thanks to my viewers, patrons, and subscribers, and anyone who's helped me out on this project or the YouTube channel uh, in general. It's much appreciated. You guys are absolutely amazing. And uh, that's not an understatement. So thanks for watching, and see you next time. The birds fly south as the light leaves your eyes Hold on to your dream Oh, I know you wanna scream Since the day you're born You're just a flower on your own Waiting for the sun